The casualties were coming from Balaclava, a Crimean harbor town now part of Sebastopol, where the British had established their forward base for the siege. The Russians had attacked and had been beaten back, but they still held the only good road into town. The community of only a few hundred residents could not support an encampment of 30,000 soldiers even under ideal conditions, let alone after a battle. Disease broke out as the local sewage and sanitation systems broke down, and the situation grew worse as the winter weather set in. Then, in mid-November, the entire peninsula was hit by a powerful storm. The base was devastated, and all of the ships in the harbor were sunk, including the one that had just arrived with winter clothing and supplies. Nightingale, her nurses, and everyone else at Scutari struggled against hopeless odds in horrifying conditions. They were receiving hundreds of patients, sick with dysentery, diarrhea, and cholera, in a building where all of the plumbing had been left stopped up for years, and only a few dozen chamber pots were available. Mattresses lay on the unwashed tile floor, crawling with lice and other vermin. Amputations and other surgeries took place in the middle of the wards, in full view of the other patients, and the spilled blood was left to mix with the sewage. The stench of the place could be smelled even outside its walls. Cleaning up this disgusting and deadly mess was Nightingale's first priority. The first thing she bought, along with a screen to hide the amputations, were brushes and cleaning supplies for the floor. After that, she badgered the hospital orderlies into keeping a regular schedule for emptying the large wooden tubs that were being used as temporary toilets. The orderlies did not like being around the tubs because of the smell, but she took them around the wards and stood next to each tub, glaring at them, until she was obeyed. By December, Nightingale had established a laundry and had hired 200 Turkish workmen to renovate a broken-down wing of the hospital, increasing its capacity by 800 patients. With her independent funds and the same stubborn determination that had gotten her through years of being denied her goals, she found ways to get around the military bureaucracy that had paralyzed everyone else. I'm a kind of general dealer, she wrote to Sidney Herbert, in socks, shirts, knives and forks, wooden spoons, tin baths, tables and forms, cabbage and carrots, operating tables, towels and soap, small tooth combs, precipitate for destroying lice, scissors, bedpans, and stump pillows. The struggle continued day after day and week after week. Winter weather ground the fighting to a halt, but the patients continued to come in, now mostly suffering from some form of cholera. Much progress had been made on cleaning up the hospital, but patients continued to die, as many as 30 or 40 in a single day. The nurses all worked long, exhausting hours, but none more than Nightingale herself. Even after a long day in the wards, followed by a long night of administrative tasks, she began the practice that quickly made her famous. As a general rule, nurses were not allowed into the wards after eight at night, as it wasn't considered suitable for ladies. But Nightingale was determined not to let any soldier die alone. She ended her duties most nights by touring the wards and checking on the patients, talking or joking with the ones who were awake, and sitting with the ones who were near death. She is a ministering angel without any exaggeration in these hospitals, a Times reporter wrote with typical Victorian romanticism, and as her slender form glides quietly along each corridor, every poor fellow's face softens with gratitude at the sight of her. When all the medical officers have retired for the night, and silence and darkness have settled down upon those miles of prostrate sick, she may be observed alone, with a little lamp in her hand, making her solitary rounds. Soon the soldiers were praising her themselves, either in their letters or in person when they returned home. On February 24, 1855, the Illustrated London News ran an illustration of Nightingale making her rounds. It was uncredited, so no one is sure who drew it, but the most likely candidate was a Dutch-born illustrator named Constantin Geis. Some artistic license was taken. For one thing, the type of lamp shown in her hand is wrong. But it captured the British imagination and turned Nightingale into a celebrity. A legend had been born. <laughs>